you know, and then I think my players uh, typically grade like Ella grade 10, 11, 12, want to play at the highest level. A lot of them are worried about their academics as they should be in female hockey. It, there's just, I don't know how they fit it all in. Half my players had part-time jobs. Like I, I'm exhausted just thinking about it. Um, but I'm not sure what the solution is at the minor hockey level. Uh, Cause there's just so much ice time and um, you know, you can't have the kids practicing at two o'clock in the afternoon. So um, I'm sure Peter's got a different perspective as a, as a coach, but I, I think this is a big challenge beyond just the national team or the professional levels. I think it filters down all the way uh, to minor hockey as well. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure I have a different perspective, but uh, <laughs> first of all, Sil, thank you very much for uh, being here. It's uh, super to have you. I look forward to reading your book. Um, I, you know, a few things. Uh, one, I think you're right on with the meditation. Uh, I think, you know, that's so important. We started that uh, at McGill a number of years ago. Um, it's been great for our athletes. Um, really positive experience for them. Uh, the sleep has been huge. That's been a real cornerstone of, of you know, one of our parts of our training has been um, helping the athletes to get the right amount of sleep, um, helping them to sleep um, well, if you will, um, making sure that they get the opportunity to rest. That that whole idea of um, managing the energy, um, I think, really has to come into your, your planning that you do with your team. Um, you know, there's a, the, the saying that um, sleep is a weapon. And um, at, at McGill, we constantly, you know, reinforce that. And, uh, you know, at McGill or at any other academic institution, as you well know, that's a challenge because the students go to class all day, then they're coming to, to uh, practice, and then they're going back to the library or home to study, and some of them are pretty late. So trying to help them with that is, uh, is hugely important. But one of the things that I wanted to <clears throat> mention, um, you know, you talked a lot about the uh, about research and the science and, and everything and how important that is. And I always felt fortunate at McGill to kind of be immersed in that a little bit and have a lot of support. I think the challenge, um, you know, there's lots of challenges in coaching. I think the challenge is to get that research, get that science out to the coaches at, at all levels. And, and somehow, I think there's a responsibility um, for the coaches uh, to find out. And some coaches are a lot better uh, at learning and developing than others. But I think there's also a responsibility of the scientific community as well um, to make sure that um, information it just doesn't go into science quarterly or, but it, it's out there in, in, a, in popular literature, it's out there in a way I think that it, that it is out there, um, but somehow we've got to get it out there to to minor coaches, um, coaches at all level to understand things like how important things like meditation, like sleep, like recovery, all of those. And maybe we would get away from, um, you know, some of the boot camp kind of ideas that uh, Sammy was alluding to, um, or at least... Uh, managing it in a way where there's a challenge to the athletes, but there's also a management of the energy that's going to, um, you know, elicit top performances from the athletes as well. So those are my comments. I didn't really ask a question there, but I, I did want to, I, 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 again, I, I just wanted to reinforce what you were saying. Thank you. When Peter was talking, Peter, that's precisely the issue. And who's responsible for coach education? It is the sports governing bodies. They design those programs. And yes, while your information is extremely important and it should be at the top of the list, most are into the X's and O's of getting a gold medal, not the sports science of getting a gold medal. And uh, it, the, the uh, responsibility for that rests with sports governing bodies coming to the realization that coaches who deliver that at the youngest stages will be able to accomplish that as they grow up the ladder of coaching competitively and have far much more respect of when they uh, reach the Olympics. And it's not all about, should I reach the Olympics? It's not all about the gold medal. 
it's what you benefit from the opportunity to play a sport. So that's my take on that that answer, Sil. And I, I really, this group, I'm dedicated to making sports governing bodies aware of the ethical aspect of coaching, the moral aspect of coaching, which has to do with uh, providing a real healthy experience for everyone. Okay, so go ahead. Bob Louts has got his hand up. Bob? Yeah, just a few comments. Um, I went to the game Sunday and Wednesday, and uh, I'd mentioned uh, to Wally and Tim Wednesday night that I thought the girls were dragging quite a bit, that they looked tired. Uh, compared to the game Sunday. That was an observation. I've been through those those camps previously, and that to me has always been an observation that there's way too much going on every day for the kids to really perform at their maximum level, so we don't get a good read on what they really do. Um, when I first went to Major Junior, it was always insisted by the managers of the teams that we had morning skates. And... I didn't like that. I thought it was taking away from kids opportunity to be at school if they were out of high school to take college courses, for example, because I thought that was important. I think Kim made a comment about girls need to pay attention to their education. So do the boys. Kim, it's important whether it's major junior or not. Um, also, uh, but the managers always wanted to skate in the morning and I thought it was particularly hard on the players to not just the activity, but the drag of putting their equipment on and off that many times a year during the course of the year. When you got on the road uh, and you're traveling, you're on a bus, you might get to a hotel at three or four in the morning, or you might stay overnight depending on where you're going the next day. Most managers want to get on the bus and get going. Um, players do not need to get up at 10 in the morning to get on the ice when they got a game that night at seven. Uh, that was always a, a problem that I had with managers, uh, but I fought it till I won it. Uh, same when I went to the pro level. The pros were so used to score skating in the morning. They wanted to skate in the morning, so I finally just made it optional. I said, like, if you want to come, you come. I'll be here for you. If you don't want to come, you don't have to. Well, by halfway through the season, I would think only one or two players would come to skate, and those were guys who were getting over an injury, or, you know, something where they needed to get on the ice because they hadn't been on the ice in a little while. And I just feel that, that we do not pay enough attention to their needs, both nutritionally and sleep-wise. And it was just an observation of mine that I had done starting like 30 years ago. So uh, I noticed the Vancouver um, Canucks a number of years ago were working on biorhythms or something with the players where they had to wear watches so they could monitor their sleep. But it turned out the older guys were giving their watches to the younger guys and they were wearing two watches or three watches. And uh -huh. the experiment didn't quite work out the way they wanted it to. But at least they recognized it. And I, and I think we need to have more of that. We grind these guys into the ground and girls. Like they're ground right into the ground. These, these girls, last, uh, last night when I went to the game, or what night, I don't even know what day this game did I go to, Tuesday, Wednesday, whatever it was. Um, they're just tired. You can just see they're tired. And, and I think we need to really pay attention to how much we expect, especially from children that are still growing. I mean, they need more rest than, than anybody, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think uh, all of these comments are excellent, really. I mean, it's uh, your hands on deck and you see the need. Um, and you're right, even to this day, uh, the, at, I know several NHL players that are still being forced to skate first thing in the morning. You know, um, you have to ha go to this morning skate. So I, th I think it's it's archaic. It really is. Um, and you know, like Peter, to your point that as sports scientists, I think it's our job not just to publish in peer-reviewed journals, is to actually get the ear of the coaches, the coaching staff, all of that, and and to making you know make change and i think it's really if if you know what's the best for the entire organization is the health of the entire you know everybody in the club so i think if we i think it's you know like my job as a scientist is to really uh get the ear and also to provide to provide strategies and go okay well this is 
maybe let's monitor the heart rate variability of our athletes. You know, maybe have them invest in a watch and let me let me capture the metrics and let's see how the athletes respond. And once we, you know, we identify, like, look at the trend. This is where the athletes are going. Then we, as coaches, go, look, we're going to reconvene. You see, this is what's, you know, these light skates or these extra skates in the morning. This is what they're doing for, you know, these particular athletes. We need to circumvent any injuries, you know, overtraining, anything like that. Um, so I would say is, yeah, finding a way to, you know, have the opportunity for sports scientists to speak with the coaches and implement change like that. And I think, you know, it's great. Like, let's say the Redmen, all the Martlets are doing that. And McGill, that's that's fabulous. And I think it's, you know, every organization can benefit from that immensely, not leading to more burnout. You know, athletes are, you know, we want to exercise for the health and and for all the right reasons, but we can't be burning them out, you know, Right now, we see it, you know, these 16 year olds, you, like Bob, you're saying they look tired. To me, that's that's absolutely the wrong thing we should be seeing right now. We should be seeing the kids at their peak. So I think it just it's a you know pretty striking example of how we need to like even myself, you know, take ownership, and go, hey, Hockey Canada, can, you know, can I have a conversation with you? Can I actually help you? make change because I think, you know, and I think we all like this sort of a, you know, it's a showcase event, but it's, it's pretty telling. And it's, it's something we should, we could take back to our teams as well and go, okay, how can we use the science? Now we have all this technology we have. Uh, go ahead, Peter. I, I just it, like, I, I, it's Sammy kind of mentioned it as well about the coaches, you know, everything you're talking about here too. Yeah, applies to the coaches as well. And I think if we could get the coaches to realize, um, you know, this past year over the uh, pandemic, I was um, <clears throat> I was still working at McGill and I, I was the uh, mentor for all of our coaches and all of the sports at, at McGill. Uh, really enjoyed it. I'll probably um, do it again starting in the fall. But, you know, <laughs> the coaches have similar sort of challenges, if you will. And I think educating the coaches is a big part of it. Um, as well. And I, I think that if we can get the coaches on track in terms of their own personal health, their own management of their own personal energy, et cetera, I think they'd be much more empathetic, receptive, uh, understanding of the of the big picture as well. So I think, again, I didn't mean to, to interrupt you, but I, I think everything that you're talking about is so important for athletes, coaches, all the staff members, if you will. And I, and I, I understand uh, um, that that's kind of what you're alluding to in your book as well about, you know, getting off that that treadmill and managing your energy in a way that you're going to be productive. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I think it's the team and the team game. All, obviously, it starts, yeah. uh, you know, from the coaches for sure. You have to lead by example. And, you know, if the coach is eating junk food and, you know, staying up and doing video analysis in the evening, it's it's useless and, and they're not going to be in a good mood. And then, you know, all of that, it's, uh, they, you know, put the pressure on the athletes. So, yeah, I think the overall um, health of the entire, uh, all the people involved, the, uh, it's a great point. I wholeheartedly agree. I, I think it's a great point about empowering the coaches. Um, I do, you know, that's basically my role now uh, with my organization, but I also, uh, I guess, a coach mentor with, with Hockey Canada and the high performance program. And I think Wally's point is valid. They don't, we don't need any more X's and O's, right? And, and the interesting part is now with all the different drill sharing and video platforms, you can find more X's and O's and more videos and more drills like this. But can you find, can we empower coaches with resources about how do you figure out if your players are hydrated, right? And not necessarily, you know, to Peter's point, a super detailed, you know, uh, article. Like they know it's important, but the coaches don't have the bandwidth, especially a volunteer parent coach who's just run into the rink from place to place to place, you know, and they need something that's, you know, done and, and easy to use. So I just wanted to share a little story about hydration. So this is something that I've, you know, done with my teams forever. We, we, we help them calculate you know how much water they need to drink 
and they do it for a little bit and then it kind of falls off. So one year I was privileged enough to have Megan Bozek, who I think is one of the best D in the world, uh, as my assistant coach. What a gift. And one day Megan told them how much water she drinks every day. Well, wouldn't you know, everyone started drinking more water and they had their bottle. They all had the same bottle as Megan. They were drinking more water. So it does really help, I think, to have, you know, the messages come from a variety of resources. Um, but I, you know, what struck me in terms of coach education, and this would be in your lane for sure, Sil, is that, um, you know, we did our HP1 certification here in Ontario very recently. And the first presentation was on the mental game. It was a great presentation, um, you know, great details. And I had a group of all coaches who coach in the female game. So some were male, some were female, but they only coach in the female game. And not once in the presentation was confidence mentioned. Now, I'm not saying that that's the only thing, but if you've coached girls, it's the most important thing, I think, in terms of their, their um, ability to perform as an athlete, their ability to you know, build their own confidence and sustain their own confidence. So uh, I did, you know, think that was an interesting tidbit that uh, perhaps, you know, that's not as much of a concern or it's not as much of a priority in the male game. And the, the speaker happened to be coming more from the male side of the game. Uh, but I do think there's coaches, the coaches I work with, they're desperate for the information and they want it in a way that they can just take it and use it like that same day, right? They don't have the time. And, and I think it's interesting that we provide some of these resources at the high performance level, and yet where we really need it at the community level, we provide them nothing. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones who have maybe the least time and the least experience in the game to go out and do it themselves or to be able to tell what's good and what's bad information. So that's just me on my high horse again with Wally on, on coach education. But uh, <laughs> I do think it's, you know, this, the softer stuff or the non-hockey piece of coaching um, I think is really where the magic is, uh, because that's what keeps you having fun and excited and energized for the game, uh, versus, you know, worrying about where to stand on the power play. Yeah. So we're going to go back to you. Your brain must be absolutely real and with ideas. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I think the commentary is, uh, is amazing. I think you guys, you know, have first, uh, firsthand experiences in, in knowing how, you know, the, it is a struggle to figure out a way to make things better. Um, just, uh, you know, we have all these examples of seeing, you know, uh, I guess, I guess with the pandemic, you know, how people have gone south or have athletes, you know, they lack of confidence. But I think that, again, the basis of my book is if if an individual is healthier physiologically, then the spillover is uh they have better mental health and they have the confidence so i think if we cr you know basically cross the t's dot the i's in terms of all these things that you know these tools that we know can improve our physiology we will be better you know we'll have the tenacity resilience to handle you know the, these pressures be on the world stage and whatnot but i think we have to pri prioritize the fundamentals of health and that being you know uh, you know, proper sleep, proper nutrition, and don't don't dismiss those. I think we have to get back to it and and uh, you know open up, um, really dig into how we can implement. Uh, we have to listen to the sports scientists and we have to really, you know, evolve the game and evolve our athletes and and not just do it like we did before and you know only the the strongest, the luckiest survive. It's no, we want to actually you know, evolve the game and evolve uh, the coaching staff and all of that. And I think it's, it's, it's not operating in silos. It's listening to the physiologists, the neuroscientists, um, and, and the coaches and collectively going, okay, yeah, we can do this better. And how do we do it better? And, um, we have these challenges, scheduling challenges, let's say, but there are better ways, but we, you know, we need to have those conversations or, we're just going to end up making sport another stressor in this, you know, this pandemic of mental health. So I think, you know, <clears throat> we're in a unique position because uh, we, you know, we, we push the bodies hard 
and we want human performance. So I think it's an opportunity to, yeah, like be on the cusp of doing things uh, better and better and better. I think just about everybody here, they've been in high performance sport. And anybody who's been involved in the national team program has had an opportunity with sport to meet and work with sports scientists. I was surrounded by them and the best year of my life growing up was with Dave King and the national team. And then uh, working with the Olympic team in, in 2002, the entire year of centralization, the influence on me of Steve Norris and Dr. Smith on, and Kim, Kimberly Amaral and the trainers and the synergy of the what went on. And throughout that experience and with Dave King years ago at Hockey Canada, I was taking those theory four modules, coaching modules on mental training for athletes, mental training for coaches. And I came back and implemented it in my high school phys ed classes, 10, 20, 30. And I always felt while I was working as a scout and uh, concerned with development um, that we had uh, an absolute pipeline to get to the educational system and the phys ed departments in doing things the right way, in an academically correct way, a morally correct way, and getting through to that audience of educated coaches and players growing up with that understanding and some of those tools. So I just wanted to share that with you. It's, you know, we can say, gee, we're all in silos, wiring in silos, we're disconnected with the sports scientists. And I think it's just the point is we're trying to make a difference here. That's why we exist in whatever we do. And yeah, you should be able to sit down with the powers to be and they should be able to listen to it and think about those thoughts in a deep way. So it's all about reflection, taking the time, get off the hamster wheel for a while. Let's think about what we're doing and do it better. So Tom Malloy, you, you're just sitting back, the quietest guy of all, but the guy that listens the most is learning the most. Really interesting stuff, and it's for sure. Uh, it is really important. I remember uh, Johanny coming to one of the Hockey Canada coaching conferences. And we started in the morning at 8 o'clock. Some guy was talking as we were having breakfast. And we're going to 10 at night. And he said, you North Americans are crazy. You don't know how to you know, relax and enjoy yourself and realize that too much people can't even listen anymore. Because I've, I've gone to many in uh, Europe, and basically, you go to a session, then you have coffee and, you know, cookies or something like this, and you go to another session, and at 3.30, it's all over, and you get tickets to the game at night, and, you know, and, and a lot of the stuff is uh, talking to other coaches. And I think it's our North American, you know, Puritan ethic work work ethic that drives us to just drive ourselves, you know, beyond uh, common sense. So that's Good. my take on it.